Hello everyone watching and listening on YouTube and associated platforms. I'm continuing my investigation today into the domain of cognitive neuroscience with a bit of a side foray into psychotherapeutics and the use of psychedelics in psychotherapy with some attention paid to associated uh, implications for analysis of brain function. I'm pleased today to be talking with an outstanding researcher in, that, in those joint fields. Dr. Robin Carhart Harris is the Ralph Metzner Distinguished Professor in Neurology and Psychiatry and Director of Neuroscape's Psychedelics Division at the University of California, San Francisco. He moved to Imperial College London in 2008 after obtaining a PhD in psychopharmacology from the University of Bristol. In 09, under the mentorship of Professor David Nutt, he relocated to the Imperial College to continue fMRI research with the psychedelic drug psilocybin, derived from what have been known culturally as magic mushrooms. In conjunction with Dr. Nutt, he built up a process of psychedelic research that includes functional magnetic resonance imaging and MEG imaging with psilocybin, fMRI imaging with MDMA, and plans for a MRC-sponsored clinical trial of psilocybin as a treatment for major depression. He was awarded an MA in psychoanalysis at Brunel University, London, and a PhD in psychopharmacology at the University of Bristol. He has designed human brain imaging studies with LSD, psilocybin, MDMA, and DMT, and several clinical trials of psilocybin therapy. He founded the Center for Psychedelic Research at Imperial College London in April 2019, was ranked among the top 31 medical scientists in 2020, and in 21 was named in Time Magazine's 100 Next, a list of 100 rising stars shaping the research future. I wanted to start this conversation by asking Robin about his thoughts about the relationship between categorization and implicit learning and Hebbian learning, all of those things together. So the way I've been thinking about it, tell me what you think about this, is that we have to impose a structure of perception on the world in order to even perceive it. So our perceptions themselves are categories and they're implicit. And those categories can be functional and provide us with what we need, or they can be dysfunctional and cause us all sorts of misery and distress. But that this also pertains to the question of what constitutes the unconscious. A lot of what the unconscious seems to be is the implicit category structure that we use to perceive the world through. So that's a proposition. Maybe I could get you to comment on that as a proposition. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a reasonable proposition. Uh, so much of what we learn is learnt implicitly, really the majority. And uh, the assumptions that we come to, the recognition of differences between things, which is the essence of categorization, uh, occurs uh, implicitly and then is encoded with uh, varying degrees of what you might call confidence or, or precision. And that precision develops. Uh, it can strengthen with repetition. Um, and then the encoding uh, is, is stronger and the assumptions are more influential. Um, and those processes are, are very much processes that play out unconsciously. Um, and yet they dominate our uh, thinking, the content of our thought, and our uh, behavior. Right. So, so imagine, for example, for those of you watching and listening, that you, you imagine a pianist who's playing a complex piece, and they play it repeatedly. And when they first start to learn it, they have to pay a tremendous amount of conscious attention to everything they're doing, to every finger movement. But as they play it repeatedly, they build specialized neural machinery to govern the motor output that constitutes the ability to play the piece. And so they're automating what is initially voluntary. Then imagine that they automate a mistake, like you can play a missed note or 
You can automate a phrase that's mistimed. And then you'll have learned something that is now automatic, but is also in error. And part of your theory of psychopathology is analogous to that in some sense, is that we'll practice um, modes of apprehending the world, modes of categorizing the world, and make them automatic, but they're also dysfunctional enough to cause us misery. And I guess your, your theory with regards to psychedelic usage is something, it, as far as I can tell, is that psychedelic usage enables the re, what would you say? It's, it re-novelizes the environment or re-novelizes experience so that the effect of that overlearning is ameliorated at least temporarily. And that gives the cognitive system, that gives the person having the experience the opportunity to lay down new conceptions that are less constrained by that previous learning. And then the question is, well, when, right. when would previous learning be pathological? Because that's a hard thing to figure out. So it is, it is. And, you know, analogies will help us here. And uh, one that is perhaps relevant is, uh, is rebirth. You know, mm -hmm. we come into this world, sure, with some uh, inherited models. Uh, um, and certainly they can, you know, come into play as we live a life. Um, and they're, they're activated and engaged as we encounter aspects of human experience. But, you know, as we develop and we learn and we create associations, these implicit associations that become ingrained and entrenched in our psyche, then, um, yes, it can happen that sometimes we learn things too strongly and uh, they dominate our way of thinking, our way of seeing the world, and our way of behaving. And so the analogy I, I want to come to is, is one of rebirth, is, you know, in a sense, resetting the system, yeah. recalibrating the system. And yes, then we will be experiencing the world with a refreshed level of novelty. Okay, so, okay, so imagine this. I'll, I'll go in two directions from that. So the first is that... Imagine that you grow up in a family where the interactions between the father and the mother and the children are pathological. So maybe the father is narcissistic and psychopathic, at least to some degree. And so the children grow up in that environment and they learn to respond to anything masculine as if it has these psychopathic and narcissistic characteristics. And so their perceptions are tuned in that in that. Uh, in that regard. And then they move out into the world and there are all sorts of potential male-female interactions that obtain in the actual world. And their perceptions aren't calibrated properly for the more generic environment because their specific environment was tilted in a pathological way. But now their very perceptions have been tuned. And that, that's where the unconscious is, right? It's in, it's in the structures that actually govern perceptual categories. And so what will happen for, say, a girl in that situation is she, she won't be able to see anything positive that a man might do because that's so anomalous and outside her perceptual, her domain of perceptual familiarity. And anything that's vaguely reminiscent of the pattern that she's already learned will elicit the whole pattern. So part of what happens in the psychopathological environment is that you specialize your perceptions for a microenvironment that's not generalizable to the broader macro environment. And that, that's a good way of, 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 of sort of zeroing in on what actually might constitute a form of psychopathological learning, right? So you might, you might come from a dependency-inducing familial background too, where you're really, really taken care of to an extreme. And then you're gonna learn how to adapt to that and to see the world as if that's how it's structured. Then when you're thrown out into the broader world and that level of intensive care isn't forthcoming, your perceptions aren't adapted to that macro environment, to that broader macro environment. Now, that, so that's one thing. Now, you talked about rebirth. So I spent a lot of time studying Mircea Eliade, in particular, historian of religious ideas. He was very interested in the symbolic structure of the idea of rebirth. And so the way that this is laid out in the broad mythological literature is that 
the rebirth, and that would be a baptism too, is a return to the beginning of time where chaos and possibility rule unstructured. And so, and that return to the beginning of time to see that unstructured chaotic possibility is a time for rejuvenation and, and renovation. And the, the idea of baptism is actually a, a ritualistic attempt to produce the kind of rebirth that is in principle redemptive. Now, you have a theory about how psychedelics works that makes pharmacological sense of this notion of the reconstitution of a generative chaos, if, I, if, I, if I've got the theory correct, right, is that the psychedelics blow off the overlearning that constrains perception or maybe even the learning. And the danger of that is everything, there's too much possibility and too much chaos, but the upside is a whole new set of propositions that are more germane to current life, let's say, aren't outdated, could conceivably be generated. Does that seem mm. approximately appropriate? Yes, it, it does. And, uh, you know, the, the analogy or the theme, the archetype perhaps of, of baptism is, is useful. Baptism often involves a, a shock, whether mm-hmm. it's, you know, being thrown in water or water thrown on you or a, a baptism of fire, you know. So right. there's an appeal to, to um, a period, a state of, of chaos, um, and, uh, yeah, and this opportunity for, for a, um, a second go in a sense. And, you know, for the, the child, the scenario that you were describing, um, suffering, you know, complex, uh, interrelationships, familial interrelationships, the product of that is that the child knows no different. Right. They've just learned really adaptively in a sense, even though it's the product is maladaptive, they couldn't it couldn't have been any other way. They they the product, in a sense, they can't have helped, which is probably why we, we don't, you know, necessarily incarcerate children, you know. There's an innocence there. They're subjected to things and they develop in a particular way and they can be victims. Um, but there is that curious transition into adulthood where, of course, um, you know, um, there, there are moral judgments on, on behavior and so on. And, um, and then there is an assumption that you could know, you could have known differently. You could have been another way. Uh, you know, after a certain level of development, there's sufficient metacognition or consciousness or self-awareness to not be, in a sense, a victim to your experiences. Um, uh, yeah, and, uh, you know, these, um, these rebirths, uh, if you look at mythology, they may happen, you know, as a kind of... Uh, rite of passage yeah. around a certain age, coming of age. Um, and perhaps there's a clue there again to, to some of the historical use of psychedelic plant medicines right. for that purpose. Right. Well, well I, I don't remember if it was in one of your papers or one of the associated papers that I've been reading lately, but the proposition too was that you talked about baptism by fire, is that if an organism is sufficiently stressed, that can re that can produce a state where rapid new learning is possible now that's what should happen right because if you're stressed hyper stressed that means something has gone radically wrong and when something's gone radically wrong that's a good time to learn something new but the proposition too was that what the psychedelics were doing in some real sense was pharmacologically mimicking the neuropharmacological conditions that might obtain after severe stress, and so, but, right. but inducing that pharmacologically. That's right. Mm-hmm. So, so this is a, a model I introduced uh, maybe a couple of years ago now called uh, pivotal mental states, and really, it's a way to conceptualize and contextualize what psychedelics are and what they do. And, and I propose that they are drugs that that hijack a stress response system. But that stress response system 
has evolved and exists anyway, of course. Uh, it has to. The drug has to come in and, in a sense, hijack and work on something that already exists for a, mm. a function outside of the context of a, you know, somewhat alien chemical coming in that, that you put into your body. Um, so it was, a, in a sense, a way of, of sort of having a more foundational understanding of the psychedelic experience. You know, what is it outside of the context of psychedelic drugs? And so there I looked at things like ascetic practice, extreme experiences that can drive intense states of stress uh, where one comes to a crisis point, a pivotal mental state. And then in that pivotal mental state, this moment right now really matters right. as to where, you know, your life's going to go from here on. Slash Jordan. Yeah, well, that strikes me as analogous to the phenomenon that's often noted among people who recover from alcoholism. So it's very common, and I knew this, I learned this almost 30 years ago when I was studying alcoholism and its treatments. Even then it was known that one of the most reliable treatments, and, and this has stayed constant in the research literature, was religious transformation. And so you think, well, and they, these are hardcore non-religious scientists who are putting this forward as a proposition. It's just a fact drawn from decades of observation about what works and what doesn't work in the treatment of alcoholism. Most things don't work, including treatment centers. But, but one of the phenomena that are, that's constantly reported by people who have recovered from alcoholism is that at some point they hit rock bottom. Right? And they have a devastatingly stressful experience as a consequence of the fact that their addiction has gone out of control. And that hits them with devastating force. And you can imagine if that's a hyper stress response and it opens up the doorway to new learning because it's so stressful that everything in the environment gets renovelized in some sense, that's associated with an experience of awe. And there's a religious element to that because the transformation is taking place at a very deep level. And so they, they hit something that's hyper stressful and then they're prepared for, a, for radically new learning, for personality retooling in some, in some sense. So, and then, so, okay, so then I was thinking too. So, you know, in, in psychotherapy, there's a rule of thumb and it's a good one that if you can, help people confront what they're afraid of and avoiding in manageable bite-sized pieces, then they get stronger and braver. So, so imagine this, imagine there's a hierarchy of implicit presumptions. Some are key and core, and those would be the assumptions that if disrupted cause traumatic stress. And then there are less crucial assumptions, which are more like peripheral perceptions, and they're ones that still have a lot of play. They're not hyper-learned yet. And they're not a lot of, not a lot of other conceptions are dependent on them. So they're more peripheral. So then when you do exposure therapy with people, you have them confront the micro uh, categories that they're using to, to constrain and, and formulate their behavior. And they can modulate those. And so they stress themselves a little bit, and that's enough to produce a little bit of learning. But if you do that continually, the system can incrementally grow and change without having to undergo dramatic stress-induced revolutions. Mm. Yeah, what, what I would want to add in there is that perhaps it's, it's it, perhaps unlearning is even more important than learning in that process. So you know, the patient is being brought back to uh, traumatic memories, traumatic themes and feelings. Um, but the patho pathology that they present with is one of arguably excessive learning, uh, you know, a defensive learning yeah. that needs to be unlearned. And so in order to bring someone back to some semblance of, of health, there is arguably a need for a 
a confrontation to go back there. I mean, this is the principle of exposure therapy. Yeah. To go to go back there and actually weaken associations that have formed too strongly to produce the psychopathology. So, so one of the things you wrote about in your new paper is the emergent literature pointing to something like a general factor of psychopathology, right? And then when I read that, I always think, well, that's neuroticism. It's the same factor analysis. It's pointing to a susceptibility to negative emotion. And when I, after I talked to Carl Friston, I was trying to sort out in my head the difference between neuroticism and openness, the difference between neuroticism and creativity. Now, creativity allows you to shift categories. Neuroticism seems to be the susceptibility of categories to stress-induced disruption. And so then the question is, like, so you get stress, and you talk in your paper, the one you sent me, about the fact that stress also produces neural death, especially in this hippocampal systems, for example, that are key to the movement of information from short-term attention to long-term storage. So imagine that when you encounter something stressful, the first thing that happens is that there is category death and perhaps neural death that's proportionate to the degree of stress. And that might be a necessary precondition for learning, but it's not learning, right? It's just the falling apart of old pathological systems. And that's a problem because, well, now you don't have the old pathological system, but you also don't have anywhere to go, right? So it's only the death without the rebirth. And then people experience that with extreme pain too, because, and I I wonder sometimes too, if that psychogenic pain like depression, for example, isn't actually the psychological consequences of the neural degeneration and the category death that, well, that we're referring to as a consequence of stress. Possibly, yes. I mean, a theme I'd want to bring in uh, would be disconnect. And uh, I suspect uh, if we take a classic uh, aspect of neuroticism like depression, um, then um, uh, there is, I think, depression, and of course this has been written about um, extensively and famously by the likes of of Freud, um, there is a... A, rit- a sort of forced retreat from objects um, that one would in- invest in, often implicitly mm-hmm. love objects, mm-hmm. you know. But that that's meant very um, broadly and generally, so that might be one's vocation, you know, that is uh, an object of uh, intense investment or in Freudian language, uh, cathexis, mm-hmm. um, the investment mm-hmm. of libidinal uh, energy, and Freud's model of depression was that that investment that we do when we, you know, have get up and go, and we write papers and fall in love and, you know, love our family and children and so on. If that's cut off, if there's a forced retreat, um, then where does that energy go? And it, you know, and, and that was, you know, Freud's model of depression that it's sort of dammed up and it gets deflected back on, onto the self mm-hmm, mm-hmm. in this uh, very self-critical Way so I think I, I, it's a bit tangential there, but but I, I wanted to bring in the theme of disconnect because I imagine that there's something important in in neuroticism when it develops into a depression uh, that involves yes yeah, some kind of inability to invest in. Okay. in so in so I've been trying to conceptualize that neurologically. So imagine that imagine that there's a hierarchy of conception. Right? And so we have some fundamental conceptions upon which many other conceptions are predicated and some that are less fundamental. Now, before you question a category, the category should fail. Now, then that raises two questions is how severe is the failure? So let me give you an example. If you have an argument with your wife about the dishes, that could mean that you should negotiate who's going to do the dishes, or it should mean that you're you should get divorced. Now, the thing about someone who's depressed is that they'll take a micro fight and it'll cascade all the way up the conceptual system to the most fundamental level. They might go even beyond, well, not only should I get a divorce because my marriage is hopeless, because then they'll go, who could stand to be married as, to anyone as hopeless as me? 
I've always been hopeless. My whole past is hopeless. There's nothing good about the present and everything's just going to get worse in the future. I might as well be dead. And so what, imagine this. Imagine that there's a hierarchy of conceptions and there's a barrier for error propagation. And the barrier is something like the number of errors you have to experience at each level before you'll move up a level to question that presumption. And so then imagine the more neurotic you are, the fewer failures it takes at any level to move up another level, to move up a level higher in the hierarchy and question something more fundamental. And and maybe that's serotonin mediated. So as you become more socially confident and your environment is actually more benevolent because you're more well-placed, your resistance to error cascade increases. And when you're depressed, there's no resistance. It's every error propagates all the way up to the most fundamental Mm. level. Men, is it time to stop mindless scrolling? Time to finally gain that higher quality of life you know you're missing out on? If this sounds familiar, then on January 9th, join thousands of men all over the world to embark on a 90-day journey together in search of a better life. It's called Exodus 90, and it was built to help men enjoy the freedom of becoming who they were truly made to be. Exodus 90 guides you in removing the attachments that are holding you back from a better life. And it actually works. Independent research shows that Exodus 90 men report considerable shifts after the first 90 days, including stronger satisfaction rates in their marriages, more meaningful prayer lives, and dramatic decreases in time spent on their phones. For the past seven years, Exodus has helped more than 60,000 men build a roadmap for living with virtue in a culture that offers far too many paths to self-destruction. Is it time for your Exodus? We start January 9th. Find resources to prepare for Exodus at exodus90.com slash Jordan. That's exodus90.com slash Jordan. Yes, if it's, if, it, if it's that, because another possibility is that the data, you know, in predictive coding, we often talk about error coming up the hierarchy uh, and sort of prediction or model coming down the hierarchy. But what one might think of depression and a lot of psychopathology is too much top down. You know, in a sense, reality, and you can see this in depression, you know, the notion of depressive realism is only partly true, typically a, a, a proper depression, you know, uh, the real deal is, is in a sense, delusional. Right, you know, right. The, right. Uh, and you can measure this and, yeah, yeah, you can see that people's, you know, forecasting of future life events is way off. They think that only bad things are going to happen, nothing good. And then you can actually track that and see what happens. And you see that, you know, people were catastrophizing yeah. and the reality wasn't that bad. You know, so that's depression. So I would argue that that's, our, that's too much model. And the, the model is skewed. And we, we sort of touched on this earlier, you know, tilted in a particular way, biased in a particular way. So there is this fascinating question of, why are you biased? Where did, where did that skew come from? Why are you having to see the world through this bias, through this skew? What, do, what does it do for well, you? Well, one of the mysteries there too, this is why, okay, so now we have a conflict in view of depression in some sense, because the way I put it forward was that it was an excess of, of error-induced chaos. And the way you just put it forward was that it was a, a pathology of constrained forecasting. And, but there's a, there, there's a point of agreement, right? We're both agreed that something fundamental has gone wrong. And we know this, right? Mm. Because, yeah, the depressive realism stuff, mm. mostly cognitive behavioral, or social psychologists using cognitive behavioral derived scales used people who were just barely threshold for depression to formulate the depressive realism idea. If you have yeah. people who are yeah. really depressed, it's like, Everything is terrible. It's always been terrible and it's going to be terrible into the future. Something, and so what's really interesting about that, and this is why something, some fundamental set of propositions must have gone astray because, and you're thinking about it as something that's canalized into a very narrow channel. And I'm thinking about about it more as the disintegration of anything positive. But, you know, there may be a way to reconcile that. It's that it, it's, it's, it has to be fundamental. It has to be a primal 
set of conceptions because it colors absolutely everything, right? Nothing escapes from the depressive abyss. And so mm. it has to be disruption in a system that's so fundamental that all other cognitions and perceptions depend on it. So this is part of the reason I was trying to make sense of it in relationship to social status, right? Because we know that if someone's social status falls, their tonic levels of serotonin constraint decrease. And the, log the logic in that from an evolutionary perspective would be that the more you're situated properly, optimally, within a social hierarchy, the more benevolent the environment actually is. Because you have friends and you have people you can rely on and you're getting a lot of attention from other people. And so it makes sense that you don't have to be hypersensitive to error because you're buffered. But so imagine you, you get depressed and, you're, and the mechanism that is adjudicating your social status is pathologized and it rates you as a one out of 10 instead of a 10 out of 10. And then the consequence of that is your whole nervous system now is tuned to react as if the environment, the whole thing, has now turned on you and is dangerous, which, which it is if you're actually socially isolated and, and extremely unpopular, right? You are in that mm. sort of danger. So Yes, but, that, but there is this interesting other possibility. I mean, it is a very delicate um, question of whether a pathology is uh, adaptive or, or maladaptive or, or functional or dysfunctional. And, and uh, it has been argued, you know, that a depressive episode is, is functional, you know, in a situation of extreme social dilemma. Uh, maybe it makes sense, in a sense, to, to, with, to retreat, to withdraw from the world, in a sense to hibernate for a while, to stay out of trouble for a while. Mm. Another possibility, and this, again, you know, uh, I do have a fair bit of time for certain Freudian ideas, and an, another one in relation to depression was that it, it, um, it's often repressed anger. So rather than, you know, some social dilemma plays out and you get aggressive and you, you do something dramatic, you know, you kill someone, then this could be a this could be fatal for you <laughs> very easily in a, you know a social network uh, um, way back when or, or now, um, and so you know this is the argument for civilization and its discontents that actually you know to re to retreat to withdraw to go into oneself to hate oneself instead of for example your boss that sacked you or your partner who uh, was adulterous or what have you, you know, is, could, could be functional. I, I know that well, makes no, no. depression. Well, no, yeah. no, I, think, I mean, I think that it points to an underlying permanent existential dilemma, which is, well, if you try and you fail, that could be in a micro endeavor or a macro endeavor, if you try and you fail, well, you have two options. Well, you have three. One is you can just ignore it. And sometimes that's the right thing to do because if you tried again, it would work. And so that's the utility of persistence. But you'd, and you never know in some fundamental sense whether you're being persistent or blind. That's a tough thing to figure out. Most entrepreneurs who become successful have failed in a dozen enterprises before. And so are they persistent or have they failed to learn from experience? It's like, well, there's a toss up. Then, then for, imagine you don't ignore it. Okay, now you're going you're gonna to fix the problem. Well, then you have two choices. You could fix the world or you could fix yourself. And let's say, well, fixing yourself is often, at least in principle, easier than fixing the world, although sometimes the world is wrong and you're right. Not very often, but sometimes, you know. So if you're going to fix yourself, you've failed multiple times. The first thing that has to happen is that the part of you that's error-ridden has to die. And so... There is that element. That's exactly, I would say, in some sense, the payoff of neuroticism is, well, why have negative emotion? It's, well, you get anxious so that you stop doing things that might cause your own destruction. Like, there's, there's value in the signal, but because it's so difficult to determine, like, if you're arguing with your wife, this is a constant issue in marriages, it's like, well, should she change or you? 
And the answer sometimes is she should, and sometimes the answer is you should, and sometimes the answer is you both should, but it's not like that's easy to figure out a priori. Now, you know, I, I think your, your argument you're making in favor of depression in some sense is that, well, now and then you should retreat and learn from your failures. And of course that's the case. Now, the problem with depression is that you get these macro retreats where everything falls apart. And you might hope that you're not in a situation where the right reaction is for everything to fall apart very often. And it does look like people who are prone to depression are prone to having everything fall apart when it would be much more meat and right, and even in terms of learning for something smaller to be modified. One of the things I tried to do with my clients all the time was to, I wouldn't say minimize a problem, but it would be to parameterize it. You know, like maybe I'd have a, pro a client who was so afraid of their economic uncertainty that they wouldn't even tell me how much rent they were paying because I had clients like that. And so I would continue to inquire till I got them to admit the terrible truth about their rent. And then we could narrow the problem. We could keep narrowing the scope of the problem so they didn't feel like the problem meant their entire financial future was going to fall apart. And, and it's that... And there's a canalization in that, right? That narrowing where that's actually beneficial. And so the model you sent me, the paper you sent me, I think, if I've got it right, concentrated mostly on this overlearning as the fundamental source of psychopathology. So, yes. And, uh, uh, and that, that, was, uh, that was very intentional. I mean, I, I do believe it, uh, but uh, I, I would like to think that one useful aspect of the model is that it invites people to understand pathology, uh, to understand how it can be acquired through experience. People can be differentially vulnerable or sensitive, but the patholog pathology does have a history. There was a process mm -hmm. there. Um, and I think that that can help caregivers and patients because it says, you know, you can, there is some understanding to be done here. I mean, if that wasn't true, psychotherapy wouldn't exist and people wouldn't share their problems and try and understand it. Um, and often, you know, the process was very complex and, um, you know, not all the information is necessarily uh, so easy to decipher and, and clear, um, but that doesn't mean that it hasn't developed and hasn't been acquired. And, and actually, there is some logic to mm -hmm. the presentation that, that comes about. Now, that doesn't mean that you then accept the pathology. So I just wanted to emphasize that. Right. It just says that we could understand this, but it doesn't say... Ah, uh, it's functional that you're depressed, so we just will we'll leave it alone. Better you're depressed than be, you know, a murderer or, or what have you. Right. Um, so then there's this question of, well, if you understand the presentation, you could also understand, um, in a sense, by understanding how it serves you. Take an addiction, for example. You know, someone with an awful history of complex trauma, repeated abuse, develops a... Uh, hard drug addiction, and uh, do you rip that away from them and, and say, be well now, have a huge, you know, psychedelic experience and go fresh, go happy now, you know, or, or is there something a little bit more gentle and sophisticated to how you would treat a, a presentation like that, even if you are to treat it with, say, psychedelic therapy? Well, well on the addiction front, I mean, generally let's say with alcohol addiction, which is a particularly pernicious form of addiction and one that's often deadly in the immediate recovery because if you're suddenly deprived of alcohol and you're an alcoholic, you can die of a seizure. That's very common, in fact. And so you have to take people off alcohol somewhat slowly so that doesn't happen. But if you put people in a treatment center, you can get them over the physiological dependence in a matter of weeks. But generally, the literature indicates that as soon as you put the person back in their environment, the probability that they'll relapse is almost as high as it would have been if they never went to the treatment center at all. And this speaks to what you just said, is that the thing is, 
And this is part of the adaptive structure of the pathology. So you might think, well, the reason you're an alcoholic is because you drink too much alcohol. It's like, well, that's one reason you're alcoholic, and it's a cardinal reason, but here's some other reasons. All the things you do socially are focused on alcohol. All of your use of leisure time is alcohol use uh, learned. All of your friends are likely to be alcoholic, right? And so when you throw the person who's now no longer alcoholic back into their original environment without preparation, as soon as they go see their old friends, the probability that they'll start drinking again is extremely high. And it's because not only do you have to remove the, the pathology of the dependence, but you have to substitute a whole new set of skills that provides all the positive interactions and ways forward that the entire addictive lifestyle provided before. This is partly why when an Alcoholics Anonymous works, it works is because it provides people with a new peer group. And so, so there is this problem. You could have the death of a pathological system, but then, okay, the, the thing that was destroying your life, the, the presuppositions that were destroying your life are now defunct, but that doesn't mean that you now have a life. And so, so and this, this points back to a, this conundrum that we've encountered in our discussion so far. You talk in this paper that you sent me about this general factor of psychopathology. And as I said, when I see that, it reminds me of factor analytic studies of emotion showing the powerful factor of negative emotion, neuroticism. And so it's definitely the case that this general predisposition to intense suffering is part of that single factor of psychopathology. And that's more like a propensity to experience stress in, re in response to chaos and error. But that's different than the claim that it's pathologically canalized learning processes that are core to the essence of psychopathology, right? Because you're, you're really talking about a pathological excess of order in some sense, whereas neuroticism is a pathological susceptibility to chaos. So I'm still trying to work out the, do you, do you, think, do you think that there's evidence that the overlearning hypothesis that you're developing is the same hypothesis as that which emerges out of the factor studies of, of general psychopathology? Black Rifle Coffee Company is helping you knock out your holiday shopping with a ton of awesome new products this year. Shop the best brewing gear, thermoses, mugs, and apparel designed for folks who love country and coffee. Black Rifle sources the most exotic roasts from around the globe. All coffee is roasted here in the U.S. by veteran-led teams of coffee experts. Stuff your Christmas stockings with the latest roast from America's Coffee for 10% off with the code JORDAN. Better yet, sign your secret Santa up for a coffee club subscription. Imagine the joy of a pre-scheduled coffee delivery, your favorite roast when you need them most. It's the gift that keeps on giving. Black Rifle Coffee Company is veteran-founded and operated. They take pride in serving coffee and culture to people who love America. Every purchase you make with Black Rifle helps support veteran and first responder causes. Go to blackriflecoffee.com and use promo code JORDAN for 10% off coffee, coffee gear, apparel, and when you sign up for a new coffee club subscription. That's BlackRifleCoffee.com with promo code JORDAN for 10% off. Black Rifle Coffee, supporting veterans and America's coffee. I think there's, there's work to be done to measure what I mean by canalization. Right, right. That pathological overlearning. And then to see whether it is true that across the board, transdiagnostically, so in whatever you know category of psychiatric disorder, you'll find this phenomenon, and it will be there, and it, it will be strong. You know, that's the hypothesis. That's the model that I've presented. I call it the the canalization model of psychopathology. Um, and, you know, as I say in this paper, um, simple models are, are, are simple models. They're too simple. They don't um, claim to explain everything, but they, they do propose to be able to explain something important. And, and so th 
you know, the the idea with this new model is that uh, there is a principal component, you know, a dominating factor to psychopathology. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm putting forward this idea that it's excessive um, associative learning done for psychologically defensive reasons. Right. Well, okay. So in the same paper, when you're talking about the use of psychedelic therapy, you put forward some cautions. And so some of the cautions are, well, maybe psychedelic therapy would be less warranted in situations where you already see an excess proclivity towards associative thinking, like pre-psychotic states. And so imagine that we could, we could hypothesize perhaps to begin with that there are pathologies of order and there are pathologies of chaos. Those might be more associated with neuroticism. There might be pathologies of creativity that would manifest themselves, let's say, in something like manic depressive disorder on the manic end. So I'm wondering if that single factor of obsessive overlearning that you're describing would characterize a subset of pathologies that are specifically characterized by overlearning. So that would be, like, do you know, has anybody tried treating obsessive compulsive disorder with psychedelics, for example? Because that's yeah, certainly, yeah. 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 So, so what happened? Yes, they, they have. Okay. Well, um, yeah, pretty promising findings and it's being repeated now. Um, I think uh, Yale, Imperial College London are, are doing trials uh, and a trial has been done, I think, in San Diego. Um, so, you know, it's an indication that makes sense. Again, I do hmm. think it, it fits the model of, uh, of uh, you know, over-potentiated ways of thinking and or behaving, the compulsive action, the need to wash one's hands or, yeah. you know, have these intrusive thoughts that, uh, that repeat. Um, and this very narrow category view, categorical viewpoint, right? So much of the world becomes yes. disgusting. And we know that the psychedelics are good at treating addictions like cigarette smoking. And that's also, that's a, that's a good model for canalization because the nicotine produces that hyper learning. So, so, so I, I would say to your question, is this in a sense, I don't know if you use the, the word just, just a subset. I, I would say it's the majority subset. That's mm-hmm. the idea. It, it's the principal component. And that's not to say there aren't other components, say a component of uh, hyper-associative thinking and behavior, mm-hmm. erratic, mm-hmm. like a delirium. Um, and, and one can argue whether a manic psychosis is like that. It, it may be in a sense, but sometimes it's quite quick for that state to become canalized as right, well. Right, right, right. Um, uh, and, and, and also to say that that component, that component of hyper associative thinking isn't, arguably isn't fundamentally pathological as well, because that's an infant, you know, that's an infant that is someone in a, you know, state of, uh, um, gosh, like a creative, like fugue state, yeah, you know, yeah. um, yeah, um, so it's harder to see that actually, in my mind, as, as obviously pathological. Yes, it can be highly unusual to see that in a, a grown person, an adult, um, but uh, it, it happens. And actually, you know, going back to those pivotal mental states, those conversion type experiences, they often feature that. Yeah, and, and they can be life saving, those experiences, you know? Right. And actually, right. this. Now we're coming to the really the flavor of of the psychedelic experience as well. Right. Okay. So so let's talk about the psychedelic experience for a minute. So when Huxley wrote about the psychedelic experience in the Doors of Perception, he referred to Bergson, who made the claim that in some real sense consciousness was like a reducing valve. Is that part of what our brains are doing, and they are primarily inhibitory at a neurological level, is taking an unbelievably differentiated, or unbelievably undifferentiated mass of experience that's far too much for us to process at any one time and narrowing it incredibly to the few elements that constitute the focus of our attention at any one moment, maybe as little as three or four bits of information from a stream of, it, of 
information that would be incalculably dense in terms of available bits. And so some of this canalized learning that you describe is actually the use of perceptual categories to reduce that information flow. And so what seems to happen in the psychedelic experience is that that a priori restriction on perception and its associated emotions is lifted temporarily, right? And so the, the Bergsonian or Huxleyan model of psychedelic experience that it increases the breadth of that information funnel, that seems to be correct. And that's also been associated, if I remember correctly, with increased thalamic throughput. So there's actually more information coming up from the sensory and the motivational and emotional areas of the brain during a psychedelic experience than under normal conditions. I think that's Wollenweider's work. I think he's concentrated on that's, that. And that's so, right. Uh, Mark, Mark Geyer, yeah. It, it's true. I would say that the thalamus is, is, is one of other, um, in a sense, hierarchically subordinate structures and systems that, where the information can flow up to, mm -hmm. to high-level cortex more freely under a psychedelic. The reducing valve analogy and that it goes back to Bergson is curious because uh, canalization as a theme was, was sort of brought to prominence by uh, Conrad uh, Waddington, uh, evolutionary biologist who used it to try and explain phenotypes that get stamped in, that get entrenched, you know, encoded into the genome. But uh, uh. He took it from, from Norman Whitehead, who took it from Henri Bergson. Oh, there we go. And Henri Bergson, yeah, he offered the analogy, the image of a canal, of a canal. Uh, and so that was the original inspiration. So it's curious that, that Bergson inspired uh, Huxley with the reducing valve. Right, right. That's an interesting... So here's something cool, too. This is a bit of a segue, but you'll catch the significance of this. There is a paper published in Nature just two months ago looking at uh, genetic mutation. Okay, so the idea is that genetic mutation is essentially a random process. And the reason for that is, well, let's talk about genetic mutations that are brought about by radiation, solar radiation, and so forth. And so they're randomly knocking atoms out of the genetic structure and producing random mutation. But it turns out that the error correction post DNA damage is not random. So the older the genetic structure that's being damaged by the cosmic radiation, the higher the probability that it will be repaired by intrinsic DNA repair mechanisms. So there's a hierarchy of, of genetic presumption built into the code. And so the cells will allow variation on the fringes to take place without correction. But if the mutation affects something that would be fatal, and because it's so core to the actual biological uh, continuation of the organism, then the probability that it'll be error corrected reaches 100%. And so this is, you can think about that as an analog, it's analogous to the conceptual structure, right? Imagine there's a hierarchy of conception. The, the deeper the conception, the more fundamental it is to the whole cognitive process, the, the, the more caution there should be in undertaking any sort of radical, radical revolution because it's yes. too destabilizing yes. and the less likely that yes. will occur. So, yeah, so that was, that's yes. an amazing finding as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, you know? so. that's neat. And that's canalization. Yeah, right. that's, the, that's, you know, the, these are phenotypes that, uh, that matter, that are, that are essential and... Uh, um, you can't rip them up, right. you know? You could have some variation at, at a superficial level, some creativity there, but uh, maybe don't mess with certain fundamentals. Well, that's, um, what, that's, well, that's what happens in post-traumatic stress disorder too, it looks like, at least to some degree, is that fundamental conceptual structures, like the trustworthiness of other people or the trustworthiness of human beings per se, is brought into question, and that demolishes whole swaths of the of the systems that interpersonal communication and interaction yes. depend upon. So yeah, but you'll see, Jordan, that's that's true of borderline personality disorder as well. You know, others can't be trusted, uh, the catastrophizing, the splitting, um, and it's true in depression. You know, where I 
I, you know, wherever there's, there are these biases uh, in depression, you know, I'm worthless, life is pointless, I'm better off dead, and so on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, they are, they're exaggerated, in a sense, they're exaggerated responses. And yeah, and, and then they're skewed, and, and they're skewed beyond the data. They're a sort mm-hmm. of exaggerated response so, to the data. So, so let's think about th- that data. So I've been thinking about how, how psychopathology might be defined formally. And so we talked earlier about the idea that a child might have grown up in a micro environment where they learn patterns of communication that are not applicable to the broader macro environment. So imagine in the macro environment, Imagine you have 100 interactions in a day with different people. Imagine there's a pattern that you have to manifest for those interactions to go well, and that it's stable across all 100 interactions. So like one rule would be, don't swear at someone the second you meet them. That's not gonna iterate well across multiple interactions. So people, of course, people don't do that, but my point is is that there are ways of conducting yourself that are gonna get yourself in trouble regardless of situation, right? So you imagine, I had a friend, I used to go shopping with him, he was extremely socially fluent, like a real expert. And when we would walk into shops and the shopkeeper, the, the clerk would approach him, he always took about 10 seconds to make personal contact with the person. Instead of immediately asking them whatever instrumental question leaped to mind, he would ask them, how they were doing and he actually meant it. And then he would listen and he'd ask them, you know, where they worked in the store. And he'd try to find out something that they were proud of about working there. And he was really good at this. He'd make a solid connection with people right away. And going to different stores with him was extremely enjoyable because he would open people up and then they would also be extremely helpful. And so he had mastered this style of interpersonal communication that worked across multiple instantiations. So you could imagine that the definition of a pathologically canalized interpersonal style is one that worked in a given microenvironment that was extreme, but doesn't generalize well across multiple social situations. It's something, so so, so there's a, so Yak Panksepp, for example, he, he paired animals together, rats together, to let them play repeatedly instead of just once. Now, if you just let them play once, the big animal can dominate the little animal. But if you have them play repeatedly, which is what they do in a naturalistic rat environment, the little rat who could be defeated, the big rat has to let him win 30% of the time or the little rat will stop playing. So what Panksepp showed was that across iterated social interactions, there was a pattern of social uh, ethic that had to be instantiated if the social interaction was going to maintain itself. And so, and obviously what you're doing when you're dealing with someone clinically is you're trying to snap them out of the narrowness of their pathologically sheltered environment and enable them to adopt a pattern that generalizes across multiple social situations. And so whatever healthy would be, would be that pattern that that iterates well. Now, that doesn't mean we can specify it precisely, but it gives it a kind of conceptual framework. Yes, yes, it, it does. And, you know, it makes me uh, think of, um, you know, it makes me think of, uh, of, <laughs> of, of archetypes and of, um, of perennialism, you know, uh, and mm-hmm. the psychedelic experience when people have a realization that every type of being is in me, you know, mm-hmm. um, um, and uh, I can know love and compassion even if I haven't experienced it, you know, and then developed pathology because of the harsh, um, maybe unusual or at least skewed uh um, upbringing that uh, that I had, but then. Um, so wh- why do you why do you it, think it reminded you of the idea that there's a multitude within? Do you think that's a reflection of the possibility of these diverse encounters? Is it something like that? 
Well, I mean, it's curious that it, it's not play unless um, one side can win a little bit, because um, then it's just you know do- dominating, and it's it's not a game, it's, right? It's there's no there's no play, so you have to have that natural variability. Maybe it was that thought of sort of natural variability. It can't all be hard and a lack of love and you know there's gonna be some there's gonna be some range some diversity yeah. in, in well there. that's another definition and, of play isn't it for a system to have play means that it has this ability to vary without being too rigid this is the opposite of capitalization yeah. in some real sense yeah you know and i yes. think i think that there is something fundamental to the idea of play in terms of defining what a psychopathological system isn't. So because one of the things Piaget pointed out, for example, was that in order for play to take place, both partners in play have to agree voluntarily, right? So it it sets up a joint perceptual framework and a conceptual framework that people buy into voluntarily. And so one of the things we could say about optimized social interactions is that if they're optimized, then both people are engaging voluntarily and both people want the interaction to continue. And that's a, that, that actually only happens under a relatively narrow set of preconditions, like, like the preconditions for a good conversation, right? I mean, and then you think that the conversation we're having to the degree that we've put each other on the edge of transformation and that we're allowing play to take place within us, within both of us, and then hypothetically within those who are listening, that's, we're doing it because we wanna do it, but we're also doing it because we're allowing optimized change to take place. And I think the fact that we're interested in the conversation is actually a marker for that transformation. Yes, yes, I mean, it's, it, it invites some realizations about play and, you know, what children, might say, you know, if they if they were meant to be playing, you know, that's what they signed up to. Yeah. And then the game cha- changes somehow, and one of the partners says, "I thought we were playing, but I thought we were playing." You know. Right. Or imagine if if we're having this conversation now, and instead of it being playful, um, uh, one of one of us was sort of preaching a particular view, or you know, dominating too much or trying to convince the other of yeah. the way the world is, then it would stop being fun. <laughs> and it would be like, you know, I'd be like, I thought we were playing. I thought we were having yeah, well, fun. Yeah, well, that would so. also be an indication of too rapid canalization, right? So, or, or the imposition of something already canalized. So if I was insisting that my viewpoint was right, then I would be discounting whatever you had to say and insisting that my canalized viewpoint already dominate. And so I might do that because I don't want to let any of my ideas go. That might be one possibility. Or I might do it in a cheap ploy to obtain dominance as a marker of status, right? The alternative would be that we could both play, right? And then whatever status accomplishment would go along with that so in this case, it would be, are people going to listen to the podcast? That would be a consequence, not of being dominant, but of being able to play. So, so, so there's, something about, there's something about play, I think, that's key to this issue of, of psychopathology. It's sort of like the spirit of play is ante- antithetical to the, to the psychopathological enterprise. Yes, I, I like that, and 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 then you know how play and creativity and art um, can go can go together, mm-hmm. and you know art and expression can work as a kind of a- antithesis to canalization and pathology. You know, when in a thorough, yeah, it's. I mean, <laughs> that's a, a curious one. Is you know when do you see the the best art in relation to psychopathology? And uh, I'm trying to remember now, I think, um, I mean, the, the classic one is a, is a manic episode, is mania and, and great art, you know. Um, but uh, I, I think depression and art, uh, it's a little bit more, um, 
precarious that one. Yeah, well, it could well it could easily be too that to the degree that depression is linked to artistic production, it's that the artistic production is actually part of the process that's lifting the person out of the depression rather yes. than <laughs> right, right. Yes. And 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 in bipolar disorder, you know, the quality check, you know, because it goes my all my ideas are incredible. Yeah. Oh, they're ingenious. To they're all worthless. Ah, rubbish, 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 rubbish. Oh, oh, this one. This one's not bad, mm. you know. <laughs> yeah. I, I saw a movie which you can find on YouTube of of Picasso about 1955, if I remember correctly, it was black and white. And they had him paint a, I think it was a rooster, but I'm not exactly sure, on a glass sheet. And so he spent a number of hours painting. And it was so interesting to see him play because he wasn't trying to produce a painting as the end product. He was playing with visual representation and he probably erased and repainted a hundred times while he was working on the painting. He'd paint and erase and paint and erase and paint and erase, just constant play as he was experimenting with hitting the mark. You know, and so he wasn't, he wasn't an artist who was producing paintings. He was exploring visual representation. So, yeah, so I, I think that we could start thinking about a healthy interpersonal dynamic as characterized by something like the presence of the spirit of play. But also we could think about play as a, like a microcosm of a pattern of social interaction that actually works across multiple potential domains of social interaction. You know, it's, it's why you want your child to be a good sport. Because you might say, well, it doesn't matter whether you win or lose, it matters how you play the game. The kid doesn't understand that because they want to win. But your point as a parent is, yeah, you want to win, but you want to win in a manner that makes other people want to keep playing games with you, right? And there's something that's really core to what constitutes health about that. And I, I like that conjunction of the developmental literature on play and the philosophical literature on play and its association with creativity. And the idea of that is something that's antithetical to psychopathology. Yes. Psychopathological condition occurs when all the play has been taken out of a system. Yes, yeah, yes, and sure. uh, yeah, no, I, I, I like that too. I, you, you can think of uh, people who practice being well, you know, like like uh, experienced meditators. Um, you can sometimes encounter these beings and they are, they're light. They're like a child. They're, they're an adult, you right. know, a bit like the Dalai Lama, you know, he's a bit like a big kid. Uh, maybe I, I don't know him very well. Well, you know, you know that, uh, I, what's his name? I, I don't remember the reason. Richardson, um, uh, Richie, Richie Davidson. Right. Yeah, yeah. He did uh, EEG analysis of the Dalai Lama and other prof pro like uh, practice meditators, and he showed that they showed a preferential pattern of left prefrontal activation that was associated with a dominant state of extroverted positive emotion. And that would go along with that. It also goes along with that gospel injunction, you know, except as you become like a little child, you'll in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. It's the same idea, is that to re... And it, it's also associated with the idea of neoteny in evolutionary biology, right? That we tend to evolve towards our childhood forms. That's, so, you know, a human skull looks exactly like an infant chimpanzee skull. Mm. So that's, yeah, it's very interesting. Stephen Jay Gould pointed this out. He showed that animated creatures like Mickey Mouse and so forth, he showed a whole variety of these, become increasingly neotenous as the animation propagates across time. They become more and more childlike in their mm. features. Mm. It's a kind of a universal proclivity. And so the idea with regard to mental health would be something like the ability to reattain that capacity for play actually characterizes mental health in the positive manner in adulthood. And then one question neuropharmacologically would be, do the psychedelics put more play in the system? Mm. And the fact that they allow category shift to occur much more prolifically, let's say, seems to indicate that the answer to that might be yes. Yes, so, uh, I'm leaning towards a yes. I mean, at low doses, uh, people... Uh, are often, you know, quite silly when they can can talk and 
And what plays out in their mind's eye mm-hmm. is uh, is playful, cartoon like, um, and and sort of silly and grotesque and yeah. Um, of course, it can it can go deeper and become, in a sense, can can feel more serious and frightening. Well, well, I think play, play does play that out, that occurs in play though. Like if you re- imagine that what you're doing when you read a serious novel is something akin to play, but if you read a Dostoevsky novel, you're playing at a very deep level. And so what that would mean is that instead of playing with superficial categories, which you might be doing if you just read a cheap romance, and I'm not putting that down. I'm just saying it's it's a more superficial form of play, but you can play deeply. And you know, when children are playing deeply, they're really involved in it. Like they can play pretend games with children can become incredibly serious. They can act out very complicated and even frightening scenarios in their play. They will do that. So, and I would say the seriousness of play is not a consequence of the admixture of negative emotion per se. It's an indication of the depth at which the cognitive categories are being transformed. So the deeper they fall into the play, the more radical the transformation is that's occurring. Yes, yes. In fact, the the notion of a play, like a drama, you know, uh, if it's a good play, like you know, a good theatre production, then it has it has depth and it can be serious and it can be moving and um, so quite. I, I guess the antithesis would be a. Um, play that that gets stuck and gets boring, that repeats, that loops, yeah. and and you know the analogy, yeah, or, then, or that or where it's too predictable, right? Yeah. that would be canalized in some sense, yes. too, because all it's doing then is it's running over a plot and characterizations that you already one hundred percent know. Yeah, right. Yes. So there's there's and that would be propagandistic. I think that that art degenerates into propaganda when it becomes canalized. Right. Right, you have to say this. It's like, well, we already know that. Yeah. We already know that. That's already been insisted upon. Yeah, yeah. We need some so, need some surprise. So, could you t- talk to me a little bit about this idea of local minima? You you talk about canalization in the paper that you sent me, and and you, your your proposition is something like when you overlearn something, you end up in a valley, in a fitness valley, and you can't get out of it in some sense, but. I don't, un- I don't exactly understand that metaphor. So what, how would you technically characterize a local minima? Mm. Yeah, it's an analogy for depicting states um, where the minima are substates and a local minima would be the closest substate to visit uh, where um, it has some gravitational pull. By being a, a minima, it has... Um, a gradient where you would get pulled to a to a point, um, and then so so is it, it so is it something like that? If if you've practiced, it's sort of the idea that if if you're an expert with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So that you have an a priori category system, and so anything that even vaguely approximates that is likely to get processed by that system. Is that is that and is that a is that a consequence maybe of the brain's desire to use maximally efficient neurological processing? Because if you have the hardware for a perception, you might as well utilize that rather than going through all the difficulty of having to generate a whole new perception, right? That's, a, that's very complicated. I think that works. I mean, uh, um, again, if we go to pathology and depression, such a, uh, a prevalent disorder so it's a maybe a useful one to go to again but you know if one one's mind naturally uh moves in an itinerant way here and there um and in health it it moves very freely but uh in a depression it's very easy to fall into that minima that is related to the depression that has a negative uh, bias um, so that would be a, an example right. of falling into a local so, minima. Yeah. Right, so it's something like a hyper-availability of already laid down pathways. Yes. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And there are pathological conditions where that's much more likely. 
Yeah, well, that, that, happens when, that, that happens when you have to make an immediate response, which of course makes sense, right? Because you're going to use automatized perceptual structures in an emergency because you don't have time to do anything else. So if it's familiar, it's, e it's easy to go there, you know? And so in a depressive presentation, it's easy. It's easy to fall back there. Yeah. Now, do you practice clinically? No, I don't. No, no. Just research. But you were, you were trained psychoanalytically as, as, well as, scientific, as well as neuroscientifically? Uh, as an academic, I studied and, and got a, a master's qualification in psychoanalysis. I also had my own analysis, but I've never actually trained clinically as an analyst myself. I see, I see. Okay. Let's contrast um, psychedelics and antidepressants for a moment. And so let me tell you what I understood from your papers, and you tell me if I've got it right, perhaps. So both of those chemicals seem to affect the serotonergic system preferentially. And my understanding of the serotonin system is that it, one of the things it does is modulates cognitive flexibility. In, in a, and so if you have high levels of serotonergic function, which would be associated with social status, let's say, you're more resistant to error propagation. Now, but the psychedelics also affect the serotonin system, but they seem to decrease cognitive specialization and canalization, right? And so they make the system more open, not to catastrophic failure, but to play. And so uh, do you know how they, how do they, how detailed is our knowledge about how that's actually occurring at a cellular level? What, are, what, are, what is the chemical itself doing at a cellular or, or, even, a, or even a higher order biological level? Mm. So if we uh, begin with the classic psychedelics, compounds like LSD or psilocybin or DMT, then the chemicals are binding to serotonin 2A receptors. So a certain serotonin receptor, one of the at least 14 serotonin receptors, These receptors are heavily expressed in the cortex and especially so in high-level cortex. And they're expressed postsynaptically, so on the receiving um, neuron of communication. Um, and they modulate the excitability of the host cell that the receptor's okay, on. Okay. So when they're stimulated... Do they make it more excitable? More excitable. It's more excitable. All right. It? And so actually it all begins there. Because if you think of excitability like temperature, you're kind of dialing up. Mm -hmm. You're dialing up temperature, you're dialing up the excitability of the cell. But the catch, it seems, is what that translates to in terms of population level activity. Because all the computation and the map to, I guess, information processing and, and experience, it, it doesn't seem to happen at the single cell level it's it's how the cells interact and interrelate and and really it's it's once we get to the population level so populations of neurons uh oscillating together whether so is is that within cortical columns or between them or do we know well or is that dose dependent it would be a great thing to know and i imagine that there's increased communication between cortical columns where cortical columns are like basic computational information processing computational units uh, in, in the brain, the cortical column, like a column for a particular, you know, orientation in, in space, recognizing that. Right, and so they're called, specialized for certain yes, kinds they're specialized of for, for and they have sparse communication between them. That's right, yeah, but, but high communication within them. You know, and, and right, right, and that's right. yes. Yeah, so they're specific for specific categories. So at the very rudimentary level of visual processing, like or things oriented in this uh, vertical domain or, or horizontal. Um, so mm -hmm. yeah, I, I suspect that there's communication, increased communication across cortical columns. And if we look at uh, things like uh, systems or networks in the brain, which we can map quite well with functional magnetic resonance imaging, for example, then we can see that there's increased communication across networks under psychedelics. Mm -hmm. That's actually mm -hmm. a very well replicated finding.
Uh, okay, so so let me throw something at you here and tell me what you think about it. So, so I've been conceptualizing, conceptualizing neuroticism as the proclivity of a conceptual system to collapse in response to error. So the more the higher your levels of baseline negative emotion, the less error it takes per unit of collapse, something like that. So, and then you can you can make an analogy. You can you can make an analogous case for creativity. So. We know that creative people, if I ask creative people, if I give them a word and then I say, tell me all the words you can that this word reminds you of in a minute, you can map out their associations and the creative people will produce a higher volume of associations, so they're more verbally fluent, but their associations will be more distant in conceptual space. So the less creative you are, the more synonymous the the co-activated words will be. So then you can imagine that if your cre- creativity is in part a consequence of how much co-activation of idea is likely to take place, but then it's also a function of how distant the co-activation. And so if the psychedelics are increasing excitability, I wonder if they're doing something analogous to the co-activation of more disparate columns as well. Now, it's strange because they also seem to inhibit semantic um, processing to some degree. People become less able to talk, able to verbalize what's happening to them. So it doesn't exactly look like it's semantic excitation that's occurring. It's more like it seems to be occurring more at the level of image in some sense than semantically. But there does seem to be this broadening of creativity that, and the analog might be there, that excitability, is that any given idea is more likely to activate a set of associated ideas. Yeah, there is some evidence in this direction of things like uh, category mixing, uh, binocular rivalry paradigms, you have mixed percepts uh, occur more mm. often under psychedelic uh, psychedelics. Also, when looking at... Um, spreading semantic activation. Uh, um, th- uh, it, it, there's evidence that the semantic network is, is broader under the psychedelic. Okay. Okay. Um, so um, while people might not be able to articulate themselves very well, um, they, the, 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 the semantics in terms of meaning is, is certainly very rich. It is. Yeah. Well, you get this permanent effect too that um, Roland Griffiths detected, right? So in his psilocybin experiencing participants, the ones that reported a mystical experience showed a one standard deviation increase in trait openness, which is the creativity trait, one year later. That's a walloping effect for a single dose. You know, it also makes, you know, I read that and I thought, wow, that's amazing. But it also made me sort of leery because it does indicate a permanent transformation. It looks like a permanent transformation in personality and in neurological function. Now you might think, well, it wouldn't hurt everybody to be moved one standard deviation up on the creativity scale, but you'd only say that if you assumed that creativity was a benefit without a cost. And I've never seen a benefit without a cost. So, you know, one of the things, I'm wondering, for example, if you're, if you're higher in neuroticism, to begin with, is an increment in openness a plus or a negative? Because I've known really open, highly neurotic people. And one of the problems with that personality constellation is that they often saw the branches off that they're sitting on, right? Because their ideas are so, they can't get a grip on anything stable because they're so mutable in their cognition. And that seems to drive a certain degree of negative emotion, right? Because they're always, they can't settle on any identity, for example. And so they destabilize themselves. And like, I don't know if we've, you know, we've looked for pathologies associated with creativity for a long time. And manic depressive disorder seems to at least, at least in principle to be associated. There's not a lot of evidence for the pathology of creativity, but like I said, you, you don't often get a benefit without a cost. Yes. Yes, it, it, I imagine uh, openness sort of tops out into um, 
on other personality scales, like uh, I think it's the Isenck one, it would probably be called psychoticism. Um, and, you know, so, uh, and also trait schizotypy is maybe right, right. crossing over right. with, uh, with extreme, extreme openness. Yeah, well, you get a false positive problem, right? Because the thing about creative people is they're pretty good at identifying patterns in sparse data. But the problem with identifying patterns in sparse data is sometimes you th see things that aren't there. Mm, apophenia, yeah. Yes, mm. and, and I think that's one of the limitations, one of the things to watch out for, one of the pitfalls of, of psychedelic use um, mm. uh, and maybe psychedelic therapy is seeing things that aren't there or, um, yeah. in a sense, look being too zealous in one's learning from the data that's allowed to come yeah. up. Yeah. Well, I talked to Dennis McKenna. McKenna, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And and so they were the brothers who established the protocols for domestication of psilocybin mushrooms, right? And Dennis and his brother, Terence, who's the more famous McKenna, they went to Mexico. I, I did a podcast with him just a couple of weeks ago. They went to, I think it was Mexico decades ago, and ate a lot of psilocybin mushrooms in a couple of months. And it the experience gripped Terence in a way that never really let him go from what Dennis relates. And Terence developed these, some of his ideas are very interesting, but some of them were quite Baroque and strange. And Dennis told me that, you know, those ideas, some of them had to do with uh, alien possession, for example, because it's not that uncommon for people who are having a psychedelic experience to have experiences that are akin to alien abduction experiences, the kind of thing John Mack reported. And it wasn't obvious. It seemed that Dennis had concluded that some of these ideas had gripped Terence for decades in a way that produced a different kind of canalization, right? They knocked him out of his normal perception, but they knocked him into a new state where he saw patterns that he then pursued literally for decades that turned out likely to be both false and counterproductive. Yes. And so, Yes. Well, whereas the practitioners of health would say things like, hold it all lightly, in a sense, don't believe anything, you know, uh, like the Buddha said, <laughs> um, question everything and mm. test, test it all yourself. Don't take anything on faith, in a sense. Um, there is this other thing that can happen where you take something like an intense DMT experience where it feels like you've encountered another dimension altogether that's populated right. by seemingly sentient beings and you come back from that compelling experience, uh, deeply immersive experience, and you come back from it and think, oh, I didn't know. I didn't know that that other world actually exists and I've experienced right, it right. now, kind of solipsistic uh, reasoning. Uh, and, and it is a bit like, you know, a kind of apophenia trap. You're, you're like, ah, oh, well, I've experienced it. I've seen it. Now I know it's real. Right, well, and I've seen it with emotional punch yeah. too, right? It's not merely the perception, it's the perception. See, this, is, this also happens to people... I've tried to understand the phenomenology of paranoid schizophrenia. So here, here's what happens to someone who's paranoid. So imagine they're watching the TV. Maybe the Pope's on. And all of a sudden, what the Pope is saying is hyper meaningful. So it seems like one of those experiences, maybe it's because the person is stressed, that their a priori perceptions are no longer filtering their current perception. And so now all of a sudden, the Pope's message is hyper meaningful. And it manifests itself emotionally. They can't look away. And they feel it's as if he's talking directly to me. It's the only way they can explain it. Now, more intelligent people are more likely to become paranoid if they become schizophrenic. So the first thing that happens is they have an aberrant experience. And the experience might be, well, it was like the Pope was talking to me. And maybe that's not even enough to get them going. Maybe that has to happen three or four times with different news media. And maybe it's only when a certain topic is being discussed, right? And so then they conclude, the only way to account for this intensification of emotional experience is that I am being specifically targeted, that I have some cosmic destiny, let's say, something like that. It's the only thing that makes sense out of the emotional experience. And then having established that as an axiom, they build a whole paranoid 
belief system on top of it. And the thing about talking to someone who's paranoid schizophrenic is that within the delusional axiomatic system, they're pretty rigorous. But the axioms are something like, oh, I'm absolutely sure the Pope spoke to me when he was on TV. And you can't shake that, right? That becomes, that becomes the axis around the which the whole world turns. And it seems to be instantiated in them because of the intensity of the emotional experience when that message was received. Yeah, and yeah. Yeah, this, this, uh, Shatish Kapoor is um, called the aberrant salience, like the right, the, right. the salience which uh, he and others would relate to dopaminergic functioning. You know, there's a hypersensitivity of the mesolimbic dopamine system, and that's encoding the excessive salience with which you're imbuing certain experiences. And so, in a sense, there. It's feeding a Hebbian learning, actually, you know, an associative right. learning. Um, and no, well, the Pope is it, speaking. Well, if it me, is, yeah. if it is, if it is dopaminergic too. I mean, the dopamine system produces that sense of reward, so that would be real, like en engrossed engagement. But the dopamine system also produces reinforcement, and so it sort of backtracks the neural patterns of activation that occur just before the reward and it strengthens them. So not only would you get that sense of grip because the message, say, is being delivered to you, but along with that dopaminergic hyperproduction would become an increased probability that those neural systems are in fact reinforced in their development by the very experience. Yes, well, it, it's confidence, you know, when you're, ah, I get it now. I get it now. Yeah. You know, it, it, right. it comes with a feeling of that's, that's, you know, slanted in a positively valence way. It, it feels good to know. It feels good to be confident. And typically, right. it, it's difficult to be the opposite of confident, um, to be swimming in uncertainty. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, right, right, exactly. Well, that, that also accounts for the attraction of certainty, right? Is that... When you're certain of something, well, and this is relevant to your model, if you're certain of something, you dispense with what would be excess entropy. Like the entropy is all the doubts. What well, could be this, could be this, could be this, it could be this, could be this. I mean, that's, there's play there, but it's, well, I think part of the distinction there too is that's involuntary play, right? When you're plagued by doubts, you're not playing. It's you're subject to them. It's different than sitting there contemplating different possibilities sort of at your own rate. It's a very different thing to be visited by an intense barrage of doubt. And that's, no one enjoys that. And, and that might again be the difference between neuroticism and creativity, right? Because a neurotic person who's like obsessing about doubt is contemplating a whole set of ideas, right? But so you think, well, what's the difference between that and creative play? And a huge part of it does seem to be the distinction between voluntary and involuntary. You know, one of the things you do for people who are obsessive is you say, well, you know, you're disgusted by this thing you're looking at. And, and then that thought comes and visits you involuntarily. Before you go to sleep at night, bring that thought to mind voluntarily and play with it. And if they do that religiously, let's say, that'll often decrease the intensity of the thoughts. So whether you, you have the thoughts in the spirit of challenge or whether they're being forced upon you also seems to be an indication of whether you're playing creatively or if you're subject to something like neurotic overload and stress. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and when, when we think of, uh, um, you know, certain so-called third wave psychotherapies like mindfulness-based uh, cognitive therapy or acceptance and commitment therapy, I guess there is a promotion of a ability to sit with difficult feelings, to almost play with them. You know, some of the mm -hmm. acceptance mm -hmm. and commitment therapy techniques involve play. Like, you know, you have a arachnophobia and, and you'll you'll wear a toy spider around your neck. I guess that's exposure right, therapy, right, but, right. but you, you know, or, or you have a negative cognitive bias in depression thinking you're worthless and you'll wear a sign that says I'm worthless. And the fact mm -hmm. that it's there all the time becomes like comedic and it, it loses its punch because 
it's out there and it's silly rather than it's in here and getting chewed well, out. Well, you're, you're, also, you're also reversing the predator-prey relationship in some sense, right? If you're afraid of spiders, but you're wearing one, you're now bigger than your fear. You know, and if and so and so you've 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 even though you still might be afraid, you're you're also allowing that part of you that can transcend the fear to become the part that you're identifying with. And and you do that constantly in psychotherapy is to and you know one of the one of the constant findings with regard to exposure therapy is it's not so much that people get less afraid, it's that they get braver. And the distinction there is really important because it turns out that if you expose a person voluntarily to one thing they're afraid of, they become less afraid of classes of things. You know, the, psych, the psychoanalysts, when they went after the behaviorists for exposure therapy, they said, you'll get symptom substitution. You know, you train someone who's agoraphobic to get in an elevator, they'll still be afraid of death. But it turns out that if you train them to expose themselves to the elevator, they are simultaneously exposing themselves to the fear of death. And they actually become braver across contexts as a consequence of the single exposures. And there is something in that that's, that's play. You know, with my clients, I always, I always used to play with them. It's like, okay, there's the elevator. You don't want to look at it. Can you look at it from 30 feet away? No. Well, how about 40 feet? How about 200 feet? Like you'd find a place where they could play. It was right on the edge of their fear, right? And then, and so there was play right on the edge of fear. And then maybe you could get the person 40 feet away and say, well, will you look at the elevator for like, just glance at it? Will you look at it for 10 seconds? No. Will you glance at it? Yes. Can you glance at it for two seconds? Yes. You just push that horizon of play. And you do that sequentially across sessions, and that seems to work. Well, it's sort of like how people learn everything, right? Because you learn on the edge, mm. and mm. the edge is where the play, edge is where the serious play takes place. Mm. Mm. So, yeah. So, what are you working on now? You've got this paper you sent me that, that's coming out, I presume, at some point in the future. It was a preprint. Yeah. What it, what's the what's out the horizon of your investigations at the moment? What are you what are you contemplating? Mm. Well, I, I do quite a lot of uh, brain imaging work, uh, trying to better understand uh, what is the psychedelic experience in the brain, how, how's it encoded in in brain activity and bodily activity. It's easy to be too brain centric, but it does seem to be a very important organ for experience. Um, uh, so there's that. So I'm doing, I'm, I'm planning uh, an extensive, intensive brain imaging study of the psilocybin experience. Uh, oh. People will have repeat sessions with the psychedelic, uh, f- um, four separate dosing sessions with psilocybin, um, including quite high dose sessions. And the majority of the session will actually be spent in a MRI scanner. And so this hasn't been mm. done before. We've done, you know, 10 minutes at, 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 at the most, really, um, of a, what we call a resting state run. You close your eyes, the scanner runs, and we collect some data and then make some mappings to subjective mm. ratings. Mm. But what I'm trying to do now is to be a bit more involved with the experience sampling. So the, the sampling yeah. of your experience with uh, more regular subjective ratings. Um, but in order to do that and not contaminate the data with asking people to do ratings, you need a lot of repeats. You need a lot of data. So this is why mm. we have to dose people. It's actually four times and have them go into the scanner um, for three more or less hour-long sessions under drug. Wow. How do you keep the experience positive for them when you're doing that? Because that it's pretty clinical environment generally to have people in an MRI. And of course, set and setting is so important to, to the facilitation of a, a psychotherapeutic psychedelic experience. How do, you, how do you manage that with the MRI? Yeah, well, it's surprisingly well tolerated because it's, it's, it's actually quite unsurprising as an environment. Um, and mm. we will have a pre-dose scan where people will acclimatize um, 
And, and so that initial habituation to being in an unusual environment that is very loud and and when the first you know tone of the scanner begins, um, it can be quite jarring, but that's be, being repeated all the time for a long period of time. So you very quickly habituate to that initial shock and then it becomes actually very reliable. There's not nothing you know new entering your visual field apart from what's playing out in your mind's eye with that eyes closed. So it's quite a sta right, stable right. environment. And, you know, you can, you can go very deep. Um, and we, this isn't a clinical trial. We won't be recruiting people with, say, depression for this study. These will be people who, you know, meet criteria for, for being healthy. Um, right. And, uh, and we'll also have had previous experience with psychedelics, and that's a, a safety consideration here. So we are trying right, to right. go deep. It is a sort of psychonauts, um, you know, dream in a sense. Uh, right, a study right, like this, right. yeah. So what what are you what are you hypothesizing? What 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 has what's known already about brain activation during psychedelic experiences, and how will you extend that? What are you what are you expecting to learn? Yeah, well, this entropic brain principle is something I introduced. Uh, oh, yeah close to 10 years ago now, which is a, a very simple principle that says that the, the entropy or the unpredictability of spontaneous brain activity increases during the psychedelic experience. And the magnitude of that increase in brain entropy correlates with the uh, increase in the richness of conscious experience, the richness of right, okay. uh, phenomenal consciousness. Okay, so so let so okay, so let's let me ask you about that. So there's this emerging idea. I suppose it's a couple of decades old, but it's been elaborated more recently that consciousness exists on the border between order and chaos, right? And that, and and your proposition there is that if you add more, if you add a richer activity set entropically that the field of consciousness or the breadth or the depth of consciousness actually increases. So what, what, do you, what do you make of ideas that consciousness, whatever it exists, exists on the border between order and chaos? And what do you think it means ontologically for consciousness itself to expand as brain entropy increases? Yeah. Well, it, it's the psychedelic experience in terms of what it's like to be in that state. That 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 model is there in the entropic brain model as well that says that consciousness exists at so-called criticality, you know, that critical mm -hmm, point mm -hmm. uh, um, between, uh, you know, the extreme poles of extreme order like a frozen system or a, an extremely you know, random system like a gas, you know, there's some kind of mm -hmm. critical point at which you get certain properties uh, of organization, things like hierarchical organization, um, long range correlations, or um, freer information flow throughout the system. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah. information transfer across scales as well. So like fractal organization. Mm -hmm. Um, so why does that? Why does the hierarchical organization and the fractal organization emerge at criticality? Why, how are those related? Yeah. Do uh, we know? I, I imagine some people know, and it's probably to do with efficiency. Um, it, it, it will, I imagine it's to do with efficient information transfer. Um, it doesn't happen so well in a frozen system because things don't go very yeah. far. There aren't sufficient dynamics. And then maybe in a gas, things are just too loose. There's no integration. Right. So, so there's a sweet right. spot. So you get, so that's it. So, it, so the, the claim is something like that at that border between chaos and order, hierarchical organization, well-structured hierarchical organization is likely to emerge. Yeah, and I guess it does say that okay. hierarchy in nature serves some kind of, you know, efficient um, function, um, some adaptive function. So, so, it's useful. Well, so, you know, in the in the Genesis chapter, that's essentially that's essentially the model that's being pointed at. So, what you have is the the proposition that the divine word is the creative 
agent is something like the idea that the order that is good emerges out of the dynamic interplay between order and chaos. So the process of dynamically intermediating between order and chaos is something like the word. And the word in the Genesis chapter is specified as that which generates the habitable order that is good. That's the proposition. Then there's a meta proposition that emerges out of that, which is that the spirit of man and woman is made in that image. That's the fundamental axiomatic proposition that the narrative is putting forward. It's very interesting to me that that's true at the mythological and narrative level and that it's increasingly mapped out at the neurological level using language that's actually quite similar, right? The chaos, so the tohu vabohu is what the spirit of God contends with at the beginning of time. And tohu vabohu, I'm probably not saying it right, but it's also teom, which is a derivation of the word tiamat, which is Mesopotamian. And it's the dragon that Marta carves up at the beginning of time to make the world. And so it's it's like this place where what's predatory is encountered and mastered. That's all hidden in the symbolic complexity of that initial story. But the fundamental idea is that there's an eternal process that operates at the border between chaos and order. And if it's operating optimally, it generates the order that's good. That's the days of creation. So it's very much analogous to this idea that the hierarchical structure emerges out of this interplay between chaos and order. Uh, there, so. there is this other curious angle here. You know, if psychedelics can uh, increase um, properties uh, of criticality, signatures of criticality like fractal organization, uh, long-range correlations, um, mm. Uh, there's things like critical slowing, which means that the system doesn't recover very quickly. It recovers slowly from a perturbation. That perturbation sort of reverberates through the system more easily. It's a more sensitive system when the system's at criticality. Anyway, all of those mm. properties, uh, if psychedelics increase those, um, the strength of those signatures of criticality, then that implies that normal waking consciousness is poised uh, what I understand, I hope I get this right, would be a, a subcritical regime towards order, towards that frozen system. Mm. You know, it's close mm. to criticality, but it's not quite there. And you can dial, right, right. dial it up further and see stronger signatures of criticality. Hmm. I wonder why it would, I wonder if it would be biased somewhat towards order for purposes of efficiency, do you suppose? Maybe for mastery. Or Maybe for mastery, you know, I, I wonder. Right, for, what, for ease of mastery, right? Yeah. Because, well, if you can implement automatized routines, it's, it's less energy demanding, right? But the price you'd pay for that is that you wouldn't be learning as quickly. But the advantage would be that you're doing what you already know how to do in a manner that doesn't require a lot of energy output. Yeah. Well, I think of it, again, a little bit like civilization and its discontents, you know, like we... Um, started to control the critical world, you know, that, that uh, was organized, is organized in, in its, you know, beautiful, rich and diverse and fractal way. But we started to, you know, manage our, our food source and, and structure our world in a particular way. And now it's, you know, it's, it's got ridiculous how, how we've done that. Um, and I imagine, and actually there's a bit of curious... Um, neuroimaging data that suggests that certain properties of brain activity that um, are suggestive of subcriticality or too much order, like the alpha rhythm. Mm -hmm. It's a very dominant rhythm in the human brain, in the adult human brain. It's lower in infants. Uh, it increases as you go up to adulthood. And, and actually, it's also maximal in humans relative to other species. So it's like an adult human rhythm. And if you look at the sort of prominence of different rhythms in brain activity, it's the main one, you know, it, it's a big peak in the alpha range. Um, so, but uh, this curious study was done in, in India, looking at different people either sort of living more, um, you know, at one with nature or people living in dense urban environments. And those who lived in the dense urban environments had stronger alpha rhythms. And for me, that was suggestive of people who are kind of 
have become kind of divorced from the criticality right, the of nature. Yeah, they're more canonized. Right, right, they're, right, right. They're too ordered, yeah. Yeah, well, the urban environment actually lends itself to that because a lot of the things that we build are structured so that we only have to glance at them to know what they are, right? So they're like a lot of our design technologies are aids to canalization. Think about the shiny outside surface of a car. I mean, some of that's for aerodynamic efficiency, but a lot of it is so you can just categorize it at a glance. It's All easy. the complexity yeah. is hidden. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And mm. so the whole urban, this is especially true in modernist urban environments. Everything is smooth and one pixel, right? And the advantage to that is, well, you don't have to pay any attention to it, but the disadvantage of it is it's pretty, it's desert-like in terms of its richness, right? Much different than the surface of a tree or a plant, say. Quite, yeah, it's, it's mind-numbing, yeah. And uh, right, so that, that right. may, may be one of the reasons why urban environments are associated with wor worse uh, mental health. Right, right, right. Yeah, well, there's, there is some indication of that and that actually it's the deprivation of the fractal structure of the surfaces that's associated with that. Yes, we, we need to, right. you know, we need to come home <laughs> to, to nature right. and, and see that practicality, to see that richness, to be reminded of our, of our origin Birth. in a sense. Yeah, right. Yeah, well, that, that ties us back to the beginning of the conversation. All right, well, we should stop this part of the conversation. And we'll proceed for those of you watching and listening. I always talk to my guests for another half an hour on the Daily Wire Plus platform. That's an addition, not a subtraction, by the way, because I wasn't doing that before. And so um, those of you who are interested, I'm going to talk to Dr. Carhart Harris, to Robin, about the development of his interest in the, in the psychological, the phenomenological, and the psychedelic. I'm very interested in how people's interests make themselves manifest and what beckons to them, let's say. Hello, everyone. I would encourage you to continue listening to my conversation with my guest on dailywireplus.com.